Hello, everyone, wherever you may be, uh, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening, uh, it's great to have you with us. Uh, my name is Michael Kugelman. I'm the Senior Associate for South Asia at the Wilson Center. I'm also the Deputy Director with our Broader Asia Program. Um, really great to uh, have you all with us. I'm going to uh, ask my colleague, uh, Abe Denmark, who directs our Asia Program, to uh, offer some very quick uh, welcoming remarks before I get started by introducing the speakers and going from there. So, Abe? Yes, uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, thank you very much to our guests for coming in, uh, uh, which is uh, rather late for many of you. We very much appreciate your participation. Um, the question of uh, this event, uh, what does the Taliban want, is a critical question of interest, uh, not only for people in Afghanistan, in South and West Asia, but for people in the United States as well, including in the US government. Um, the, as uh, peace negotiations are, have been ongoing uh, for several months now between the United States and the Taliban and now between Kabul and the Taliban, um, the Taliban has been very unclear about what exactly they envision other than the uh, exiting of uh, foreign, uh, foreign forces. So um, we have assembled a terrific group of experts um, uh, from Afghanistan, from the region, uh, who can uh, give us their views and their understanding of what the Taliban is looking for and uh, we can discuss the implications of this for the region and for the United States. Um, for, for three years now, three years consecutively, the Wilson Center has been rated as the number one think tank in the world for regional studies and this is a prime example of why we've consistently been leading the world uh, on these issues because we get top people from the region who can talk about the most important issues of the day. Uh, and I'm thrilled to have this event. I'm very thankful to Michael for organizing it uh, and for our partners for their contributions and their cooperation on this. Um, and I'm just very excited for this event. And uh, with that, I'll turn things uh, back over to you, Michael. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Abe. I appreciate those welcoming remarks. And indeed, um, thank you once again to our speakers for joining us today. And um, thank all of thanks to all of you, wherever you may be uh, tuning in. I also want to thank uh, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, which is co-sponsoring this event with us. RFERL is also the media partner for the Wilson Center on its AFPAC File podcast, which is a bi-weekly product that unpacks key recent developments in Afghanistan and Pakistan. So thank you to RFERL and especially uh, its DC media manager, Mohammed Tahir, for the support with today's event and also with the podcast. So our, our event today indeed pivots on this question of what does the Taliban want? It's a question that's provocative, complex, and also quite difficult, if not impossible, uh, to answer conclusively. But it is a question very much worth discussing, given that the Taliban concluded an agreement with the US government more than seven months ago. Uh, it has recently begun peace talks with representatives of the Afghan state, and yet its views on the peace process and related issues are rather hard to pin down because, as, as was noted, it's often vague and ambiguous on these matters. Now, the question of why there is ambiguity, whether it's intentional for strategic reasons, whether it's because the Taliban really does not have fully formed positions, or whether it's a combination of both, these are, these are things that we'll, that we'll, we'll discuss today. Um, now, many of us, many of you will know the saying often attributed to, uh, to Sun Tzu, know yourself, know your enemy, and you shall win a hundred battles without loss. The reference is presumably to warfare, but it arguably has some valid validity in the context of negotiations as well. It's arguably easier to negotiate effectively with your rival if you have a better sense of where they're coming from and where they're trying to go and ultimately what they want. Um, now with the Taliban, we know that it wants foreign troops out of the country. We know that it supports, broadly speaking, some type of political system governed by Islamic law and strictures. But beyond that, there's a lot of uncertainty. So the task today is to discuss what we do know and what we think we know about what the Taliban wants, what this all may suggest about the Taliban's future actions, and what the implications may be for the peace process. And to delve into these issues, we have with us an all-star cast of experts who closely study and in some cases engage with the Taliban. Uh, there, should, there are bios posted on the, the, uh, the event website right where you're watching now. So I'll be very brief in introducing each speaker. 
Uh, first, uh, Ibrahim Bahis is an independent analyst and a longtime observer of Afghan politics. Malali Bashir is an award-winning journalist and video producer with RFERL's Afghan service, known locally as Radio Azadi. Dr. Orzala Namat, an activist and scholar, is director of the Afghanistan Research and Evaluation Unit, an, uh, an Afghan think tank. Rahimullah Yusufzai, Yusufzai is resident editor of the News International. Um, he's based in the Pakistani city of Peshawar and has reported widely on the Afghan conflict, which has, include, has included interviewing Mullah Omar, the uh, Afghan Taliban's late founding leader. And hopefully shortly, we'll also be joined by Andrew Watkins, the International Crisis Group's senior Afghanistan analyst. Uh, he was involved in the production of a recent and very relevant ICG report called Taking Stock of the Taliban's Perspectives on Peace. Very quickly explain the format. In a moment, I will start by asking an initial question to each of our panelists. They will each respond briefly. Uh, after that, I may pose a few more questions to the group before opening up questions to the audience. And if you in the audience would like to pose a question to the panel, you can do the following. You can either email your question to asia at wilsoncenter.org or tweet it to Asia Program, P-R-O-G-R-A-M. The questions will be conveyed to me and I will pose them uh, to the speakers. So with that, let's get started. I'll ask, pose an initial question to each speaker and we'll start with, um, with Malali. Um, so the uh, question to you is how at this point in time would you characterize Afghan public perceptions of Taliban intentions and goals in peace talks and more broadly? I think you're still muted, um, Malali. There we go, thanks. Um, is this fine now? Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me an opportunity to be um, able to be a part of this panel. What we all know is that um, all Afghans want an, uh, want an end to uh, the bloodshed and uh, they want um, an end to the conflict and uh, to the violence. Uh, 19 years ago, uh, you know, that the whole world came to Afghanistan to uh, start a war against um, terrorism. And now the whole world has held um, hands together to end um, the war or uh, support the peace process, um, at least according to their official statements. Um, but um, at the same time, we see that the Afghan government and the Taliban uh, peace negotiating uh, uh, both sides, uh, the teams are busy in Doha, uh, still uh, working um, on uh, bringing, sketching um, uh, an agenda for the peace talks, uh, for the you know, intra-Afghan dialogues uh, for the past at least three weeks. At the same time, we are uh, witnessing um, an um, increased um, a number of attacks, uh, which are um, targeted attacks uh, like landmines and uh, magnetic bombs um, uh, on uh, uh, different uh, parts of the country. And um, um, at the same time, um, the, the, um, the envoy, the US envoy for Afghanistan's reconciliation has said, um, Yesterday, he said that, um, uh, I quote, that um, violence is too high and too many Afghans are dying. Uh, what is peace um, to ordinary Afghans and how do they perceive the um, Taliban's intention in the peace process and beyond? Now, we have been through our programs in Radio Free Europe, uh, talking to hundreds of Afghans, men and women, um, uh, men and women in, uh, on the ground, um, from all the provinces. And um, to some Afghans, peace is uh, going out with your family for a dinner without being attacked or with, without the fear of being mobbed or kidnapped. For others, it's going from one city to another, uh, not fearing for your life uh, on the road. And for others, um, peace means that um, an opportunity to go to school, um, an opportunity to um, employment and uh, taking part in political um, processes in the country. So uh, people are hopeful, but um, um, cautiously. 
uh, that a peace process has um, um, begun and is underway. Uh, women in particular are concerned um, about losing their rights, the hard earned rights that uh, they have been working for for the past um, almost two decades um, to earn an, uh, their right to uh, equal education, employment, and also taking a part in the political life. Um, currently, millions of girls are going to schools. Um, there, uh, there are women who are uh, governors. Uh, there are women who are ministers. We have um, a high percentage of um, uh, women in the parliament. But just uh, today, we received a report from Ghazni. I would like to um, talk about it, which, uh, which says that the education um, officials uh, say that uh, at least in 13 districts of this province, the Taliban are not allowing um, the education authorities to um, build schools for girls. So um, also the Human Rights Watch has said that um, the Taliban are, um, the Taliban remain deeply misogynistic. Um, President Ghani has said that um, Afghans are ready for peace, but not at any cost. Um, uh, I would like to talk about the um, uh, call-in shows and the programs that we have in our radio, uh, where we talk to ordinary Afghans from the ground and they call us, they talk to us, they share their co concerns, their hopes. And um, at the same time, we talk to them, our reporters go and collect a bo a box pops from them and then we air those, um, uh, those messages from uh, the ordinary Afghans. Um, there are the people um, in Afghanistan uh, looking at what we report on um, that uh, they think that the reconciliation with the Taliban is possible, um, but there's um, others who think that uh, Pakistan has influence on Taliban, and so the Afghan government uh, should be talking to Pakistan. Uh, and it's not a secret that the Pakistan has um, itself said that uh, they have influence over Taliban, but um, uh, they will use that influence in uh, bringing about peace um, and helping the peace process in Afghanistan. Um, so people are living on hopes and um, most uh, right activists uh, state that uh, um, path to peace in Afghanistan um, um, is through talking to the Taliban. And uh, so, um, but they, they do um, actually um, voice their, um, their demands that there should be more women on the negotiation table. And um, uh, the Independent Human Rights Commission of Afghanistan has said that the peace process should be um, victim-centered. Uh, and um, it should be from the perspective of those who are affected the most by this war. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, um, Malali, for that uh, for that context. Um, so, what we're going to do what we're going to do shortly is I'm going to have several of our panelists weigh in on um, uh, how they would assess the Taliban's views on several issues. But before we do that, I just wanted to have us provide a bit more context. And for that, I'm going to pose our next question to Andrew uh, Watkins um, at the, uh, the International Crisis Group. And um, question to you, you Andrew, is uh, how would you assess, broadly speaking, the way in which the Taliban has done public messaging uh, in recent months? Why has it often been vague about its views and can, should, can and should we expect to hear more specifics? Thank you very much, Michael. And thanks to the Wilson Center for having me uh, with such fantastic and distinguished participants. Um, when it comes to the Taliban's messaging, this was something that was a key element uh, that we tried to focus on in our research and in our recently released uh, Crest Group report on the Taliban, because indeed we have begun to notice what feels like a shift, a partial shift, uh, and one that still is full of concern, but a partial shift in this group's messaging, where what they have done is move uh, from almost 20 years of uninterrupted messaging, both to their fighters and their supporters, as well as the outside world, a message of armed struggle, a message of armed and violent resistance against a government that they deem illegitimate and the foreign 
uh, as they say, occupiers that have come and installed this Western friendly government. Um, the Taliban have been remarkably consistent in the content of their messaging over most of the last two decades and in some ways even before. Uh, what we have seen as talks with the United States progressed and in particular as they resumed uh, late last year and culminated in the February 29th agreement with the United States, as the Taliban began to collectively realize that these negotiations, negotiations with the United States might lead somewhere substantial and it might actually bring them benefits, their messaging began to change. And for the first time ever, we began to see messaging from the Emir, the leader of this movement himself, and from many of its other uh, political messaging elements, a message that talked about peace. Now, there were many caveats in this messaging on peace uh, and continued to insist that the Taliban are the rightful guardians of an Islamic system and of the Afghan people themselves. Uh, claims which uh, are, are disputed and controversial and in many ways outright false. Uh, these messages continued to insist that Taliban fighters should continue to fight until a process uh, at, during negotiations and peace brings the Taliban what they have been fighting for. And so we continue to hear some of the same core messaging themes from this group. But for the first time ever, this group has elevated the path to victory, which it previously said is only capable through violence and armed struggle. It is also saying now we could achieve everything we want by talking. Unfortunately, the group has not stopped its armed struggle and that's something that needs to be addressed as soon as possible, immediately. Uh, too many Afghans continue to die and be affected by the war. When it comes to the Taliban's positions, uh, when it speaks about uh, the topics that will be addressed at the peace table, when it talks about what it wants, when it talks about possible future for the Afghan state, uh, this is where we get to the vagueness and the ambiguity that you were referring to, Michael. Um, as the group has drawn closer to these negotiations, many hoped that we would begin to hear more clarity uh, and indeed, we have heard in bits and pieces more from this group on what their preferences may be for an ideal Islamic system that they claim to be fighting for. Uh, but by and large, the group and its goals and its preferences remain vague. And what we found in our research in interviews with hundreds of different Taliban figures, uh, different parts of the movement, was there was a collective sense of not only believing that vagueness could be a strength at the negotiating table, but also concern that within the Taliban movement, which consists of tens of thousands of members and potentially many more supporters, uh, there is not even a strong universal sense of consensus on what a future Afghan state would look, look like. What does an Islamic system mean that this group says it has been fighting for? The group is very clear when it comes to negative framing, when it tells us what is wrong with the current Afghan government or all the different ways that the Western influences have corrupted Afghan society. So it can tell you what it would get rid of very clearly. Many Taliban would agree on what needs to be gotten rid of, but when it comes to what should replace this, this is still very much an open question. And there's a long history of the Taliban avoiding uh, debates that could be controversial within its own movement um, and waiting until the last minute to define its own positions so that it might achieve maximum advantage. I think Ibrahim and some of our other panelists could go into further detail. We could circle back to that. But this is where Taliban messaging has been at, especially since after the February agreement. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, some very useful uh, additional context there, and I think it's provided a great uh, segue for a, a transition into a discussion about, you know, what, what the Taliban is actually saying, what it wants, to the extent that we could uh, offer some 
some uh, reasoned um, uh, assessments of that. And so we're going to start now in that regard with with Ibrahim, with Ibrahim Bahis. Um, and a question for you, and uh, I realize it's a broad question, but um, how would you assess the Taliban's views of its preferred type of political system? Uh, and in addition, getting into something that's very important um, here in Washington for US policymakers and certainly others as well, how would you assess the Taliban's views of Al Qaeda uh, and other international terror groups in Afghanistan? We know that the US deal with the Taliban um, compels uh, the Taliban to distance itself uh, and to prevent those groups from staging attacks on Afghan soil. So uh, cede the floor to you now, Ibrahim. Thank you for the kind invitation. Um, it's a privilege to be here with you all. Um, so as the questions, there are two questions, I'll try to make a couple of quick points on both. Um, there's a common misconception that the Taliban want an emirate. Uh, Zabiullah Mujahid in an interview in August, when asked about the emirate being a red line, stated that they wanted an Islamic political system and that it is the content that's important, not the form. Similar statements were made uh, subsequently by Sohail Shaheen and Naeem Wardag. Even now that the Taliban have made it quite clear that they are not looking to establish an emirate, some detractors are arguing that the Taliban want to bring in the emirate and different clothing. I would argue that these critics are ignoring the governance of the Taliban over the past 20 years. In the 1990s, the Taliban had a one-man rule in the form of an emirate. Following, uh, but following the US intervention, the Taliban's leader Mullah Omar, for obvious reasons, was not able to personally coordinate the insurgency. So in his stead, he set up a shura consisting of around a dozen more senior Taliban leaders. With the growth of the insurgency, affiliate groups set up their own pockets of influence and achieved relative uh, self-sufficiency. So in order to co-opt these groups and ensure that such centers of power don't feel marginalized, the Taliban expanded the shura and set up a highly consensual decision-making mechanism. I would say that the Taliban of today feel more comfortable or at least equally comfortable with this consensual decision-making mechanism as they do with the one-man Amir political system. This shura-based system is better for them as it accommodates more interests and power bases as in, and is thus more uh, conducive to preventing fragmentation. Worth noting that both systems have intellectual and uh, ideological basis in Islamic political thought, so it will not be a very hard sell to their rank and file. We should also address the discrepancy between the Taliban's official and unofficial statements when it comes to the emirate. Uh, in a leaked statement in March, uh, Mullah Fazil was taped stating that the emirate was their red line. When questioned by the International Crisis Group, Doha-based uh, Taliban officials stated that it was uh, a tit-for-tat move against the government's many red lines, including on retaining the uh, Islamic Republic. I would say that there was another reason for this divergent internal messaging. I don't believe the Taliban want their rank and file to know that they're willing to forego the emirate until and unless progress is made in the intra-Afghan talks. That could explain why they have been so ciphered in communicating their willingness to give up the emirate. So why would they not want their uh, rank and file to know? And why did they invest so forcefully in an emirate all these years? The answer is that as a group navigating the ebb and flow of an insurgency, the Taliban needed a system that would maximize cohesion and minimize fragmentation. The emirate, which places obedience to the Amir at the center of its ideology, offered the magic ingredient to keep the insurgency glued together. The previous insurgency against the Soviets left deep scars on the psyche of the insurgency. During the war against the Soviet Union, Pakistan's policy of keeping the insurgency fractured caused major unforeseen consequences as epitomized by the ensuing civil war between the insurgent factions in the outskirts of Kabul. For the Taliban, the ghosts of these wars loom large in their thinking and the fear of fragmentation is ever present. 
An emirate for them has offered benefits that other systems might not have. Although the popular conception is that the Taliban have not changed and that they are too rigid and inflexible, as I've tried to highlight, the Taliban have shown a certain degree of flexibility, including on major political issues, such as the centralized or decentralized nature of the state. This flexibility is generally shaped by three factors. One is their experience as a political movement and the lessons they derive from those experiences for future policy decisions. Another factor is local pre uh, pressures, for example, the popularity or notoriety of policies in local areas, especially as viewed by their base. And lastly, whether the policy can be justified relying on some Islamic discourse. A word of caution, uh, if intra-Afghan talks fail, ironically, Taliban might feel compelled to retain the emirate system due to its military and organizational benefits, even though it might not be their first and foremost choice of political system. Uh, lastly, I would argue that the Taliban's relations with Al-Qaeda and other uh, terror groups is determined by the same overarching fear of fragmentation uh, during a time that they have a real shot at gaining some degree of political power. From the Taliban's perspective, uh, its relations with Al-Qaeda is a liability with little to offer for the Taliban. As is famously attributed to Mullah Omar, that he referred to the uh, Al-Qaeda as a bone stuck in his throat that he could neither swallow nor spit out. Yet despite this, the Taliban dread taking on this group. The risks are magnified many fold when uh, talking about other groups that have strong local support. For example, the TTT, uh, TTP, sorry. Uh, so there seems to be some level of consensus that the Taliban did not have prior knowledge of the September 11 attacks. It was a case of blissful ignorance rather than active cooperation. Whether they would have thwarted the plan had they prior knowledge of the attacks is perhaps an open question. Will they prevent a future attack from Afghanistan? I would say that 20 years of war would have made that a painful lesson for them. I think there's also the question of whether they will publicly disown Al-Qaeda as a result of intra-Afghan talks, but I have already gone past my allocated time, so I'll hand the floor back to you, Michael. Well, thank you very much, Ibrahim. Fascinating, uh, very useful uh, inputs. Uh, really, really appreciate that. Um, so just a reminder to those listening, if you have a question for the panelists, um, when we'll get to the Q&A shortly, uh, you could email your question to asia at wilsoncenter.org, or you could tweet it to um, at uh, Asia Program, um, and we'll get to your question shortly. So now we're going to go to um, to Dr. Orzala Namat, um, and uh, Initial, my initial question to, uh, to her is, um, how would you assess the Taliban's views of women's rights? So, Rosala, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. Uh, good evening, uh, good morning, good day to everyone. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to be a panelist among the distinguished participants here, and I'm also grateful to Wilson Center for organizing this very important and timely discussion. Uh, although in terms of, you know, assessing the, uh, the, the Taliban's view of women's rights, I have to confess that I will uh, not wear my activist hat here, but rather try to remain a researcher and look at it in a more analytical way. Uh, but before doing that, uh, I would like to highlight on what is the woman's position. So, uh, in, in how the woman's struggle or woman's uh, role in the public space has been sort of evolving over the last you know, decades, uh, and then why it becomes a major issue. Like, for example, back in the time when the Soviets left Afghanistan, nobody raised the question of how Mujahideen groups will, you know, uh, treat women. Uh, whereas we know the violation of uh, women, uh, women's basic rights and fundamental rights and all the kind of uh, human rights violations during the, the civil war, as uh, also briefly mentioned earlier. So with the Taliban, the reason it becomes more um, problematic and the reason it becomes like a major issue, it's more to do with the background, the record history of the Taliban, uh, particularly their time of ruling Afghanistan, where they have been extremely exclusive in terms of not letting women use the public spaces in terms of, you know, basic access to basic services, 
uh, held was allowed under certain conditions that a mahram had to account buying and things was all restricted under the strict rule of um, according to Taliban Sharia, which means that a woman should only leave the house when accompanied by a Muharram. This in a context where we had millions of people dying during the, uh, the, during the Soviet war, most of the men, a clear answer uh, to widows of Afghanistan who could not have an, uh, an adult uh, male accompanion and how they should uh, survive. So, um, in my opinion, the position of uh, the current position of uh, women, uh, the, the current position of Taliban regarding women's rights is ambiguous, like uh, the ambiguity that um, um, uh, the colleague from um, ICG highlighted, I think they are also ambiguous when it comes to women's rights. They give a very vague answer always when they are asked in their essays and articles in the websites. If you look at them, they try to say that we never are against women's rights. We pr protect more women's rights than the others who are claiming to, to do it because we want to protect this uh, in accordance to according to, to, to the Taliban uh, view of Sharia and Islamic principles. Uh, but the reason that the Taliban don't have any female representation is, is very genuine. I think it would have been quite problematic to suddenly see appearance of some woman in the Taliban side of the negotiations in Doha, because it would have been fake, like in, in many ways we could see it. So in, in my view, this was a positive side from the Taliban to genuinely say that, look, we don't believe in the idea of women's political participation. That's why we don't have any uh, participating there. And the reasoning to that, uh, I think it's clear, at least for most of the Afghans. Why? Because let's look at the background of who the Taliban are. If we follow the rule or the sort of common perception about the Taliban being the students of uh, 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 religious Islamic madrasas, the madrasas are mostly populated, particularly the ones similar to boarding school in the international context, are mostly uh, um, uh, 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 a place where boys would attend. So from a very young adult age, they have never had the opportunity to interact with women. That's why it's very difficult for them to accept the reality, excuse the helicopter background <laughs> uh, noise. Um, you know where I am now, you can guess now <laughs> in, in that sense. So uh, because of that uh, uh, reality that they have never interacted with women teachers, women doctors, women, you know, um, active members of public in the public space, it's very difficult for them to accept that women could be, could be more than mothers who have given them birth, more than wives who are giving them children, and more than their sisters and brothers, who, sisters who are basically at, at the family level. So I think there is... Um, that ambiguity is, is related directly to their background. And moreover, I think uh, what, what is required at this stage is that they uh, uh, their answers are still not satisfactory. They say that they want a, 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 a principled um, position for women based on the Islamic uh, 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 Sharia. And that Sharia is a strict interpretation of Taliban type of understanding because we have been in conversations and in talks with the Taliban and often in these conversations, they never uh, uh, sort of try to understand or try to get engaged when, when they are asked about, you know, models of women being, you know, chairs or heads of Dara Leftas, for example, in, in, in the Indonesian case, or many other Islamic countries where women have quite salient a role, even in the Sharia studies itself, let alone, you know, public and political spaces. Um, I think there is also one more point, and then I will end it there, uh, and, and that is, uh, Taliban's positioning, not entirely restricted to be uh, an Islamic positioning, but also a traditional. Uh, a lot of Taliban media and try to sort of engage in the conversation, they try to portray an average or a traditional uh, practicing Muslim from a village. And I think that's hugely problematic, and I, particularly for our Western audience uh, in this conversation or even beyond, because the, the Afghan traditional society is no longer the very cl classic traditional society. The history of intervention, particularly the last 20 years, but even beyond that and the over 40 years of you know, history of interventions, the average Afghan traditional men and women 
from rural areas or from the urban areas have been subject to a variety of interventions. Uh, this could be you know, direct access to public space, to media, to med, radios, to TV, to information, to migration, that, uh, the role that migration played in terms of you know, changing people's mindsets. So in this way, also Taliban are facing problems because they try to portray that we are traditional Muslims from the rural Afghanistan and we want to represent them. And they are in trouble because now girls from rural Afghanistan are also asking for the same rights. Women from rural Afghanistan are also asking for their rights to be engaged in the local decision making. And the examples of that is in, in you know, nationwide development programs that we are seeing. Similarly, girls from across you know, uh, provinces are uh, asking their fair rights, their Islamic rights to get educated. So there also is a, uh, is, is a problem uh, in terms of you know, them trying to pose a, a, a kind of a mix of a traditional and uh, Islamic role. I hope I answered your question and I leave it there for further conversation uh, later on. Thank you very much. Back to you. Well, thank you very much, Orzala. That was that was excellent. Uh, I really uh, appreciate those those comments. Um, so we're now going to uh, go to uh, to Rahimullah Yousafzai, um, and uh, my question to him is: um, How would you assess the Taliban's views of its relationship with Pakistan? Of course, I think we all know. Those of us watching know that the Taliban. Um, has uh, been based in Pakistan for much of the much of the insurgency. The leadership has been based there, uh, but at the same time, Pakistan uh, played a very significant role, or played a significant role, as a facilitator in the early part of the reconciliation process when the U.S. was negotiating with the uh, with the Taliban. So, um, uh, so Mr. Yusuf, say your your views on. Uh, how, what you think, how you would assess the Taliban's views of its relationship with Pakistan now and moving forward. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Michael. Um, it's very difficult to get something out of Taliban. They outwardly are vague, as everybody mentioned, but I know that they have some plans they have been talking about plan A and plan B. You know, I think they have made up their mind as to what they want, but they will put their card when the time comes. I think they are waiting for that opportunity. So we don't uh, have to believe that Taliban do not, uh, are not clear about what they want. I think they uh, know what they want and that's why they have been fighting for so long. Um, basic thing is that they want power. You know, they have been fighting for power, and uh, if they can get it through talks, why not? Uh, but the question you asked uh, was Taliban view of their relationship with Pakistan, and uh, let me tell you, it's a very difficult relationship. You know, I've heard senior Pakistani military officials saying that Taliban don't listen, Taliban don't agree. When we make a proposal, when we make a request, we always get vague answers. Again, it's also vague. You know, they have a system of uh, asking their Amir, Amir al muminin Sheikh Habatullah Khunzada, and then the Shura. They want to get their opinion on issues which they are negotiating in Doha. Uh, this was the case uh, mostly in the past. Now they have got more Shura members who are engaged in the negotiations who are based in Qatar. They are saying more than 60% of the Rehberi Shura members are now in Qatar. So now it's much easier, but still they have to seek opinion. And that is a very complex and complicated system to get the opinion of the leadership who may be based in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, and sometime in Iran. So that will give them more time. It will give them several months because they say it's so difficult to approach the leadership and get their guidance and opinion and answers to a question. So you know this is what actually uh, is their 
tactics or strategy. They want to keep things vague. For the Pakistanis, I think that, you know, there is a lot of self-praise nowadays in Pakistan. The government officials, the military, the civil, the elected, the democratic, you know, the analysts, all of them are self-praising Pakistan. They say, we have done it. We were able to facilitate the peace talks and the peace agreement between the US and Taliban. They say, we were able to actually persuade Taliban to hold peace talks with the Afghan government and the Afghan opposition. So they actually believe very strongly that Pakistan has played a very crucial role. And they also have been praised by people like Zalmi Khalilzad and even Dr. Abdullah when he was here for three days recently, he was actually thanking Pakistan for its role in the peace process. So that encourages Pakistan to engage in even more self-praise. And I believe that, you know, the Pakistani policy regarding Taliban is that they should become part of the new political system in Afghanistan. They should join democracy. They should set up a political party. They should take part in elections. You know, Pakistan has been demanding and Taliban have been disagreeing that there should be a ceasefire or at least reduction in violence by Taliban. Pakistan has been demanding, you know, since say the last few years, that Taliban should negotiate directly with the Afghan government. So, you know, Pakistani demands publicly are that there has to be a peace process and Taliban should become part of that. Regarding Taliban, they want to maintain some distance from Pakistan. They're very happy that most of their leaders have now shifted to Qatar or that some are in Afghanistan or that some are going frequently to Iran because that provides them some space. Otherwise they were under tremendous Pakistani pressure. Pakistan has been arresting some of them. Mullah Birader was in custody of the Pakistanis for eight years. Mullah Ubaidullah, the former deputy leader, died in Pakistani custody. Ustad Yasser, who was the top leader of Taliban, also is believed to have died in custody in Pakistan. So Taliban are happy that they still have good relations with Pakistan, but they are no longer under the undue pressure of Pakistan. And that actually is what they have tried to achieve. They don't want to be seen in Afghanistan as Pakistan's agents or stooges. And that's why they always make a concerted effort that they should stay independent. And I think there is no better place for them <clears throat> to stay and negotiate than in Qatar. <clears throat> Taliban would never have accepted the peace talks to take place in Pakistan. Taliban still will not want Pakistan to play a bigger, more visible role in the peace, in the, in the inter-Afghan negotiations. Because they want to maintain some distance from Pakistan. Uh, they know that they are blamed for getting Pakistan's support. And I think Pakistan also realizes that. That's why in the recent past, we have seen that <clears throat> they have a relationship, you know, Taliban, Families are here. Some of the leaders are still here. They keep coming here from Qatar to meet their families. Uh, people who are injured in Afghanistan, they are brought to Pakistan for treatment. So they still have this kind of relationship, but I think an effort is made all the time to keep it quiet and secret and to show that we, actually are acting independently. I'll stop here. Well, thank you very much um, for those uh, very useful, uh, insightful uh, comments. Uh, I thought those were all very ter uh, terrific opening comments. I had asked you all to speak briefly and you all did, which I appreciate. And yet you packed your, uh, your five minutes of comments with a lot of substantive, substantive remarks. So I, I really appreciate that. I'm going to pose just a few questions to the panel, and then we uh, will take some questions from the audience. And uh, 
you know, another reminder to the audience, if you have a question for the panel, for a panelist, just uh, email it to asia at wilsoncenter.org or tweet it to um, at Asia program, and that's all one word. So um, what, one question that I'll pose, and this, anyone who would like to respond can, uh, can take a crack at it. Um, there's been some debate among analysts and others now um, about if there are some countries uh, in, around the world that provide potential models um, that reflect what the Taliban may prefer or look for uh, when it comes to its idea of an Islamic state. So in other words, do we know if there is a particular country that may best represent what the Taliban wants in terms of this broad idea of an Islamic state? Um, you know, does it look uh, to a Saudi type model, an Iranian model, Pakistani model? Uh, again, it may be very difficult to have conclusive answers, but based on what we know and that the Taliban has said about its ideas of what it would like a political system to look like, um, I'd be curious to hear if anyone would like to weigh in on this question. And again, um, whoever would like to can uh, can go. So does anyone want to take a first crack at that? Yeah, Andrew, go ahead. Yeah, um, I don't think I'll provide an entirely satisfying answer, but I do want to share some of what we've heard uh, the Taliban themselves say when it comes to other countries. Uh, one thing, and, and this goes back to our, our colleagues' remarks just now, uh, one thing that is notable and we have to pay attention to is that the Taliban have never, to my knowledge, never referenced Pakistan's system of government in spite of the similarities uh, in, in terms of uh, Islamic doctrine that is incorporated into the constitutional framework and, and how that's implemented in, in several different ways and across the state and society. Um, and it appears as if the Taliban's intense desire to not be seen as a puppet or an instrument of Pakistan is what prevents it uh, or, or what compels it to not use Pakistan's government as a basis of comparison, uh, among other reasons. I, I'm certain that you could hear other uh, discussion points from the Taliban on why they wouldn't want Pakistan's model. But the fact that they do not hold this up as a point of comparison is important. Um, likewise, there has been some uh, speculation and analysis that suggests that the Iranian model of a theocratic republic that has a supreme leader, one that is appointed by a guardian council, that this might be, given the nature of the Islamic Emirate, this might actually be uh, the sort of model that uh, the Taliban are most interested in. But I think as our colleague Ibrahim has noted, the Taliban have actually quite uh, evolved quite a bit away from their original framework of an emir centric model. And while they continue to have an emir and, and remain a, an emirate in their own words in name, uh, in reality, their, their current leadership is much more oligarchic and, and runs most of the organization through high councils and consultative, deliberative leadership. Um, likewise, we've heard from senior Taliban figures directly that they do not look to Iran as a model, and they've given a number of reasons. One is similar to Pakistan, not wanting to seem too close or too tied to any other neighboring state. Uh, the Taliban's independence from neighboring states or being uh, seen as independent uh, is paramount in the movement. The other is Taliban officials talk about the Iranian model as a revolutionary model. And, and Taliban figures insist that their aims are not revolutionary, that instead they represent tradition and law and order um, as, as Dr. Nimat referenced. Uh, sometimes even when that's not true or that's out of date. Um, when it comes to discussion of Saudi Arabia, we have spoken to numerous figures in the movement who reference Saudi Arabia, but obliquely. They reference it indirectly, not as a model to uphold, because they acknowledge that as a monarchy, this is not the sort of system that they would want to establish and build. 
but the, when they reference it, it has often been in discussion about personal freedoms and about human rights, but also about relationships with the Western community and with many of the countries that now support the current Afghan government. Repeatedly over the last two years, Taliban negotiators and other figures mentioned Saudi Arabia, and they do so by saying, listen, US diplomats or European Union, you're very friendly with Saudi Arabia. You carry out much trade and you have lots of economic engagement with this country. And yet you have no problem with the purity of its Islamic system and the way that it manages its uh, internal affairs. This is all that we are asking for. We want to be treated the way other Islamic governments that are close allies and partners of the United States are treated. So again, there's an openness, there's a vagueness to this answer, but it, it, it seems to tilt in some directions much more in others. I would open it up to the floor. Yeah, thanks, Andrew, that was great. Does anyone else want to weigh in? Uh, Dr. Namat, yes, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, just, you know, raising uh, a question on, or a point out of this question that why should we, uh, you know, even think of other models? My understanding of the Taliban from the earlier days, although I have to say that one, one thing that characterizes the Taliban since the very early days is their ambiguity. And I think our conversation so far is also highlighting that. Another thing is also a lack of consistency in their communications of what they are fighting for, what is their jihad for and all that, if we consider for a moment that what they have done is a jihad. Uh, I have problems with that because my own family was involved in the anti-Soviet war. Uh, and I think that what is going on now uh, and the way that they have approached this was not, uh, cannot be compared with that. So um, uh, what is problematic here is lack of consistency in their messaging in terms of you know, what they are actually wanting. My understanding of the Taliban currently trying to emphasize uh, make more emphasis on Emirates return. Um, uh, uh, other panelists mentioned that maybe they are not very much uh, rigid on that, but I think they somehow have been, uh, there were examples given. I think that's more a kind of a pre-negotiation tactics to, to sort of like highlight or make sort of a, a bold messaging that look, we also stand on our own idea of uh, still being considered as a state and not as an insurgent movement. Um, uh, I think the question of a republic should not be equated with the current uh, uh, ruling government. Uh, the republic is much beyond that. It's much a higher level for uh, the form of the state or the model of the state that we are having. And, uh, in, in, and if Taliban's entire war was against the so-called invasion uh, based on their own language, then once the, the international troops are out, there is no question to continue with that. And similarly, some of the Taliban that I heard through the media and through, you know, conversations were saying that there is not much there. The way that they critique some aspects of a republic is something that, you know, non-Taliban will also critique it, like the way that we have dealt with elections and the way that the elections became, you know, fraudulent and all that is something that are type of you know, issues that as soon as there is a permanent ceasefire that we are not using violent means to continue ruling and continue you know, maintaining our authority, then these, these could be sort of you know, um, be part of a discussion uh, afterwards. I think the Islamic Republic is Islamic and the Republic is uh, the history of Republic in Afghanistan is not uh, uh, related to post uh, 2001 or even to 94 when the Taliban movement just began to start. We are a republic since um, I think 73, 1973, uh, Afghanistan is a republic. Uh, and, and therefore, in my opinion, it's hugely problematic to even like give this sort of feeding to the Taliban uh, when I... The model of the state should be also point of the discussion and the negotiations. And my understanding was the negotiation was mainly about two things, withdrawal of troops and, uh, you know, ending the war uh, and the violence. Um, I just wanted to sort of add that here. Thank you. Uh, yes, Rahimullah, please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, I believe that uh, no Islamic state can serve as an inspiration for Taliban. 
I think they have their own model, uh, which they implemented when they were in power. Uh, they called it Islamic Emirate. Uh, I don't think you know Pakistan, Iran, or Saudi Arabia, or any other country can serve as a model or inspiration for Taliban. Um, they can pick and choose. Uh, they can say, okay, this uh, Saudi law is useful, better, we can uh, take it, uh, or this Iranian law, or this Pakistani. Regarding Pakistan, uh, you know, we have Islamic parties, several of them. Uh, their best performance in the elections was in 2002 when General Musharraf held elections and they got 11% of the vote. That was their best ever performance. Uh, these Islamic parties also demand Sharia, but they are doing it peacefully by taking part in the elections, unlike the Taliban who are using force uh, to, to demand Sharia. So I don't think that you know Pakistan uh, can serve as an inspiration and Taliban, I have heard them very, being very critical of Pakistan calling itself Islamic Republic and not being able to enforce Sharia. Uh, I think that, you know, Taliban realize that by agreeing to the peace talks uh, with the Afghan opposition, uh, they have actually conceded that there has to be a give and take. So they cannot really uh, demand or get whatever they want. They have to give and take. So I don't think that uh, they can have a system of government of their choice through negotiations. You know, they have to um, reach a consensus. They have to neg negotiate with their rivals and then they can have a system of government which is acceptable to all the stakeholders, all the parties and to most of the Afghan people. So Taliban actually, I think would have to withdraw from whatever they were demanding until now, they would have to seek a consensus to make these peace talks successful. Well, thank you. Um, I'm gonna start posing a few questions from the audience and uh, there are actually several for you, Ibrahim. Uh, so maybe we'll, we'll start with you. And I thought you may wanna, you, you should feel free to uh, weigh in a bit on what was just said because it gets the issues that you were talking about earlier as well. Um, so the first one is, what do you see uh, as the institutional challenges to integrating the Taliban into the current Afghan governing construct? And do you see any particular challenges with the Ghani administration specifically? And the second question gets to the issue of Al-Qaeda. Um, will, will the Taliban ever feel secure enough to once again more openly embrace Al-Qaeda? So basically the question there is, what could we envision for the Taliban's future relations with, with Al-Qaeda, which is a tough, which is a tough question, but would be curious to hear your, your thoughts on those two queries. Thank you for that, um, Michael. Um, to answer the first question, uh, I would say that uh, looking at it from the Taliban's perspective, there is no viable way that the Taliban can exercise political power that's meaningful. Other than the executive, all the other branches of government are neutered. Uh, the past several years have uh, re-emphasized uh, the constitutional powers of the executive, meaning that one is either a president or nothing, especially when it comes to control of formal state powers. Uh, the gap between what the Taliban want and what President uh, Ghani is prepared to offer uh, is so huge that uh, it's difficult to imagine it being uh, bridged. Uh, ideally, he would like to offer an iteration of what was offered to Hikmatia or to Dr. Abdullah in 2014. Uh, therein lies the Taliban's dilemma. Uh, President Ghani has proven himself to not be very credible in following through with uh, either of those commitments, uh, especially even when the uh, other person or the other party was someone that was friendly to the post-2001 political order. And I'm talking about Dr. Abdullah here. Uh, so President Ghani and uh, Dr. Abdullah agreed to a process for considering uh, revising the constitution to allow for a less executive heavy design. Instead, we have seen the opposite happening. Uh, from the Taliban's perspective, uh, there's a lot of uh, scholarly work that talks about uh, in peace processes, how insurgents face 
a credibility gap. They, they, they're the one that feel that they have the most to lose by giving up uh, the, 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 their source of strength, which is violence. Uh, and the government, uh, by comparison, usually doesn't lose out as much. Uh, so to, to assess that uh, the Taliban seem to be uh, what I'm seeing from public statements is the Taliban have um, kind of started uh, advocating for sidelining President Ghani through uh, by establishing an interim go government. Uh, this seems to be uh, becoming clearer and clearer the more communications that we're hearing from both government sides and um, uh, negotiating team members. Uh, but there may be other solutions outside the box that could potentially appease both parties. Uh, for example, changing uh, decentralization, something that uh, Dr. Abdullah is also being quite supportive of. Uh, however, ideologically, one could argue that it would be difficult for the Taliban to enter a government which is headed by uh, President Ghani. Uh, and that's because for 20 years, they've been calling, or at least for, in his case, for past six years, they've been calling him a puppet. Uh, so to join, then join a government led by him would um, be seen as a betrayal by many of their followers and sympathizers. Um, to turn to the second question, uh, if you could please refresh my memory with that. It was essentially a rather open-ended question about what we can expect for the Taliban's future relations with, um, with Al-Qaeda. Uh, uh, so uh, the question was framed in a way which I don't know if I can respond to it in that manner, but I, I will uh, comment on uh, the issue, a question I raised, which was publicly denouncing them or even potentially combating them in Afghanistan. Uh, so um, I, I would say that in, in terms of fighting Al Qaeda, it's almost uh, it's non-existent or uh, extremely unlikely to be happening. Uh, to illustrate this, let's look at ISKP, uh, um, ISIS in uh, Khorasan province or Afghanistan. Uh, IS was a new group uh, with very le weak links to the theater. Uh, they not only openly challenged the Taliban, but called them apostates and puppets of ISI. Despite this, the Taliban had extreme trouble dislodging them. It took months of propaganda, including dozens of fatwas and articles to mobilize their foot soldiers to take on this group. Even when they succeeded in their traditional heartlands, such as Helmand and Zabul, they failed to dislodge the group in the north and the east. Were it not for the combined efforts of Af Afghan security forces and the Taliban, coupled with US air power, we might still have had the group in those areas. Uh, now let's uh, imagine Al-Qaeda, a group that predates the Taliban in Afghanistan. They have extensive marital and business ties with various factions of the insurgents, including uh, Taliban. They have extensive individual level contacts with rank and file members. The group has only ever heaped praise on the Taliban. How do you get your foot soldiers to kill these people? I think from the Taliban's perspective, the magnitude of the task and the risks involved make this a prohibitive option. Uh, but for publicly denouncing them, although the uh, Taliban have made several statements that could be interpreted as being tantamount to the disowning Al-Qaeda, for example, Maulwi Hakim's uh, rather strongly worded statement uh, in the intra-Afghan talks uh, of not allowing any group to use Afghanistan for launching attacks uh, in foreign soil. Uh, despite this, it's extremely unlikely they will publicly disown uh, Al-Qaeda until at least some progress is seen. Uh, for example, the removal of their leaders from UN uh, blacklists or some degree, uh, some progress in intra-Afghan talks. Uh, it's worthwhile to note that the Doha agreement does not require the Taliban to publicly denounce Al-Qaeda. Uh, I imagine it took months of negotiations for them to get this concession out of the US. I believe that as long as the Taliban continue to constitute an insurgency, it is extremely un, uh, unlikely to publicly denounce any group unless they either publicly challenge the Taliban or their actions are so abhorrent to the Taliban's constituency that they, they feel compelled to act. Based on uh, statements uh, by Secretary Pompeo and Khalilzad, it seems like they have uh, taken some action, although it's difficult to discern what that is. But should the Taliban join a post-settlement a post government structure, I believe they will be willing to publicly disown uh, some of the groups, including Al-Qaeda, and let other government factions do the dirty work of fighting the, these terror groups.
Well, thank you very much um, for those for those inputs. We've got a very large number of questions here. I'm going to try to pose as many as I can. I may group uh, some together to maximize the uh, opportunity to uh, to have you uh, all address them. Um, two questions about uh, Taliban views on other things that we haven't described earlier. One is uh, Taliban views on international assistance, and the other is Taliban uh, views on the drug trade. So specifically, uh, the question about assistance, assuming that the Taliban succeed in getting some form of their version of Islamic governance, what may be the repercussions in terms of political, strategic, and economic support be regarding international support for a future uh, government with the Taliban uh, in it. And on the question of, of drugs, um, <clears throat> how are the various players involved in the drug trade, specifically the Taliban placed vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, vis -vis the drug trade and what can be done to, um, let's see, uh, essentially what are the Taliban's views on the drug trade and how might that evolve if there were to be a um, a new post-war government? Again, very broad questions, but any comments that any of you would like to, to put in about what the Taliban, how the Taliban might perceive or view the issue of international assistance uh, and also um, where it stands on, on the drug trade, which it of course plays a significant role in. Uh, anyone want to start? Yes, go ahead, uh, Orzala. Thank you. When it comes to drugs, I have to be the starter as uh, ARU is a leading research organization doing a systematic studies of, um, you know, uh, drugs, uh, you know, in general illicit economies. Um, based on ARU's research, what we can say with regards to Taliban's views of drugs is that although during the Taliban uh, uh, ruling, the drugs uh, trade and the drugs production uh, fell significantly in some areas, in most areas of Afghanistan, almost reaching to, to um, almost non-existent. Um, despite that fact, we cannot say that this was because the Taliban's ruling have resulted in stopping the drug production. Uh, uh, other factors and evidence from the period shows, uh, based on our research, um, the leading uh, uh, researcher here is uh, David Mansfield, who has like written books in book in you know series of articles and papers throughout the last uh, uh, two decades on this question. Uh, what we what we see is that when it comes to the drug trades, the Taliban, contrary to a lot of you know claims by some you know researchers and some organizations, the Taliban are not the sole um, benefactors of drug trade. And therefore, uh, their views are anti-drugs. Obviously, they've never said that they support it. But we also have evidence of them trying to tax uh, uh, the local, you know, productions uh, of the, or cultivation of the, uh, the, the poppy, for example. They take their uh, taxation, uh, and that's not a, a very automatic 10% based on, you know, the Islamic rule, uh, which is Usher. Uh, it's very much subject to the production rate, subject to the family's status, and subject to, to the, the resources that the uh, producers or cultivators have, uh, so that there is a proportion and there are some level of you know variations uh, contextually speaking localities uh, may differ one common thing between the drug uh, the Taliban's um, view on drugs and views on international assistance is that from both the Taliban are taking their share uh, international assistance right now is um, reaching most part of the country including areas that Taliban have stronger influence or presence there. And the Taliban, uh, for example, uh, our researchers uh, informed us that in Ghazni, they do not you know, oppose uh, schools in, in areas where they have stronger prisons. They try to let the of the salaries of the teachers reaches them. So there is a sort of an informal taxation on the, uh, on the international assistance and development assistance. Um, in terms of their views for future, um, I think it's really critical. One of the failures of the Taliban uh, dominance ruling time and the Taliban regime time, interacting with international community on the international aid and assistance. Unfortunately, we are to a level, to a high degree, donor dependent that when it comes to international assistance in the particular areas of health and education, it's out of possibility to imagine that we will be self-sufficient. 
we have to have that vision, but we are not there yet. And therefore, it's really critical for the Taliban to have a very clear understanding of engaging with international assistance in future and accepting part of the realities, you know, uh, of this side of trying to sort of have very constructive relations with the international assistance organizations, governmental and especially non-governmental, and, and, and trying to sort of proceed. Some studies, um, partly done by, you know, people who are working for both ARU and, um, um, for example, Overseas Development Institute, ODI, uh, in, in regards to service delivery and state legit legit legitimacy, is highlighting this question of how uh, the Taliban are also, in terms of service delivery, trying to uh, to sort of uh, uh, portray themselves as, you know, people who are um, politically also have a control over the issue. Uh, our desire is to see more engagement and, and, and more sort of um, uh, uh, constructive ways of approaching the issue of uh, international assistance. When it comes to drugs, like I said earlier, uh, the benefits is not reaching only the Taliban, there are more forces on both sides who are benefiting from it. On all, even third side, there is a very strong drug, you know, cartels and mafias that are also uh, benefiting from, from this uh, very massive, uh, you know, production in this country. And therefore, uh, a, a further clarity uh, in the future context of a post a peace settlement, if we can say, is, is required from, from, from all parties involved with regards to drugs and how they are going to deal with it. Thank you. Did anyone else want to weigh in on those questions before I pose a few more? No? Okay. Oh, yeah. Andrew, please go ahead. Just just real quickly, and, and to follow up with uh, Dr. Nimat's remarks, I absolutely agree, and, and she's correct. The, the drug question is incredibly complex, and, and the beneficiaries are spread across all different actors. When it comes to international assistance, the, the point that I made earlier in reference to different models for Islamic governance has also been cited um, as the Taliban, by the Taliban themselves and their political office um, as a reference to the kind of relationship that they envision. Uh, that is to say, when Saudi Arabia is referenced, it is usually to ask, why can't we just be left alone to tend to our own internal affairs? the way that the US and other EU countries leave Saudi Arabia to its own business. And yet we would like to do business the way that you do with Saudi Arabia. And, and there's another country, there's a second country that several times has been brought up within the same context in the same discussion, which is we do not want to be the North Korea of our region. And though there is not, Ibrahim made very good points about the difference to the Taliban uh, between a public denunciation and, and perhaps a quieter, more private admission. And we do hear private admissions behind closed doors from a number of Taliban figures, uh, an acknowledgement of how flawed and how many mistakes were made during their emirate era of the 1990s. Um, and, and so we, when we hear this citation of North Korea, there is an understanding among many in the movement's leadership that Afghanistan is an aid dependent country and that much more will be needed. I think one thing to uh, continue to concern us and, and the international supporters and donors and partners of Afghanistan need to keep in mind is the group has, as an insurgency, has remained very separate and far away from understanding the architecture of the international assistance and aid and even if the group's intentions are good and the peace process moves forward and succeeds, they will have much to learn as new participants potentially in an Afghan government uh, about the way that international aid and assistance and development is delivered and the way it is monitored and the conditions that are placed. This is going to be very foreign to this movement who like many other insurgent movements are happy to accept foreign aid but would rather then take control of it and distribute it and take credit themselves. So there will be a lot of work to be done on this, um, even though the Taliban do acknowledge its need. Yes, uh, Rahimullah, please go ahead. Uh, you know, I will refer to the 
uh, US Taliban peace agreement. And you know, towards the end of the agreement, uh, there is a point that Taliban won continued US assistance for Afghanistan. So in a way, they're seeking international assistance. They, they know that Afghanistan needs help and uh, they want the Americans you know, to take the lead and maybe then they will ask other uh, countries also to help uh, if Taliban become part of the political system. Uh, secondly, you know, there is a lot of interaction between the Taliban leadership in Qatar and international organizations. I have been to Qatar a few times and I know that you know, not only the UN, UNICEF, WHO, but also many other international organizations, uh, INGOs, they are in touch with uh, Taliban. Taliban has a separate commission for the international NGOs and uh, they give a lot of importance to dealing with these organizations and allowing them to work in the areas which they control. So they definitely will try to engage more than they were doing when they were in power the last time because they realized that Afghanistan needs a lot of help internationally. Regarding the drugs, just a brief point. Uh, when Mullah Omar gave that order to ban poppy cultivation, uh, as we all know that uh, figures were given that there was no poppy being grown on 85% uh, uh, you know, the territory in Afghanistan controlled by Taliban, but there was poppy cultivation in the north in areas not controlled by Taliban. We know that some Taliban commanders are also involved in um, collecting usher or doing drug trafficking. Uh, but uh, the same is true about uh, people who are in the government because all the airports and the borders are controlled by the Afghan government. So they also are involved in this smuggling, uh, trafficking of drugs. Uh, but you know, Taliban wanted to show when they were in power that they can control poppy cultivation and drug trafficking. When they were out of power, it was in their interest, you know, that this problem has again arisen. This problem, you know, is not being resolved by the Afghan government or its international allies. The Americans spent, I think, $8 billion uh, on trying to tackle drug trafficking and poppy cultivation, but failed. So I think they had a vested interest that there is more poppy cultivation and more drug trafficking when they are out of power. That could be one of the reasons why, you know, they, they did not try to stop it. Well, thank you, uh, Rahimullah, and thank you for, for the others for some very uh, interesting responses to those two tough questions. Um, two more questions, uh, one getting at uh, views of the Taliban leadership and then another getting at the views of fight, Taliban fighters. Um, first of all, what can the old Taliban constitution tell us about their wishes for the future? Why are they not discussing that document publicly? And then the other question is, um, has there been any type of meaningful shift within uh, Taliban fighters in terms of their views uh, about peace? So um, sort of one question about the leadership, one question about the foot soldiers. Would anyone like to address either of those questions? I'm happy to just very briefly make a point on, on the views of Taliban fighters. Um, we've been fortunate over the last year some phenomenal reporting has been done by uh, Afghan media as, as well as international media outlets. And there has been a small increase uh, of permissions granted by the Taliban, or at least by some field commanders to permit media outlets to come into their territory and to speak to people. Um, and so we have a bit more of a glimpse in, in open source reporting and in fantastic journalism the net result of this reporting and what we hear from these areas, and we still don't hear enough, is that there are as many different opinions among Taliban fighters as there are everyone else in Afghan society. Um, even in one valley, even in one particular area of a single district. Uh, I've, I've spoken to colleagues and, and reporters who 
meet one commander who swears to keep fighting until the emir takes charge of Kabul, even if they have to march in by force. His, his neighbor, a few kilometers down the road, is also a Taliban fighter, and he says he just cannot wait for this war to end, and he has lost too many people close to him. And so you have this diversity among Taliban uh, rank and file views that I think it's hard to characterize uh, beyond some of their very broad ideological principles, uh, what Taliban fighters actually want or believe. Um, I, I would defer to others on the, on, on the issue of the Taliban constitution. My understanding is that this was never officially ratified and that this was a document that Taliban leadership and clerics uh, discussed and drafted, but for reasons that remain unknown, uh, it, it is not canon. And, and in fact, my colleague, Borhan Osman uh, with Crisis Group noted in the New York Times the other day, the Taliban are quite unique as an uh, as a Islamist insurgent movement in that they do not have a single foundational document and that they have an incredible ideological flexibility for just that reason. Uh, yes, go ahead, Ibrahim. <clears throat> Uh, I'll just add to uh, what Andrew said. He's summed up uh, that very nicely. I just want to add that um, in terms of when we look at historically, the Taliban are very unique compared to other Islamic movements. Most other movements grew up in the uh, grew out of the fringes of society uh, with uh, dissatisfaction uh, um, uh, breeding against those in power. And that's why they built robust ideological basis uh, on which they built their um, uh, movements. The Taliban, on the other hand, was someone who had very little experience and thought, uh, had hardly thought about political issues, who were thrust forth for reasons, for various reasons, and suddenly ended up being at the gates of Kabul and uh, had to you know, govern. So they had never really uh, thought about those issues. And that does explain a lot of the ambiguity we see with, within them. Also, however, because they were someone that were in the middle of uh, making decisions as a government, it gave them a very pragmatic approach. And I think they have embraced that and decided that ambiguity gives flexibility. If you can, it, it can give you an ability to apply a, a policy in one area, a different one in a different area, depending on pragmatic factors and reasons. So they have really embraced it and they really do distinguish from other uh, groups uh, who mostly grew out of ideological thought into action, whereas these guys went from action and now they're building their ideological thought and embracing ambiguity with it. So the constitution, uh, while it probably reflects the time of the, uh, the 1990s and the thinking, the major thinking at the time, I do not think it necessarily reflects what the leadership is thinking 20 years onwards. And uh, thank you. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask Malali uh, a question uh, on that second question that I posed about, uh, about the um, possibility and shifting views within um, Taliban fighters, you know, earlier you had talked about, uh, or you'd been asked to address public perceptions about the Taliban and what it's looking for. Uh, I mean, how would you assess Afghan public perceptions about fighters themselves? I mean, we remember the famous pictures a few years ago during one of the, uh, the brief Eid truces when you had Taliban fighters in cities um, in, mingling with, um, with, with the people. Um, how would you describe um, sentiments about these these fighters separate um, as distinct from the Taliban leadership that's at the negotiating table? I'd be curious if you want to highlight any any uh, feedback in that regard. The reporting that we have been doing is um, actually um, we have to look at what drives these Taliban soldiers to go into war and fight in the first place. So there are different reasons for these people, the foot soldiers. Um, but mostly uh, people who we have talked with and um, we have been able to go into their areas sometimes and uh, talk to these people um, uh, um, the, under the um, Taliban controlled areas and also during the truce uh, time when they were mingling with the uh, public. And these people are actually <laughs> wary of war, they want this to end. Um, uh, people who we have talked to, but um, um, as I said, we have to see 
what the reasons are for everyone. Now, I think that uh, the Taliban had a very difficult time in convincing their foot soldiers to keep fighting because um, uh, at the same time they are talking to the uh, government and to the United States and then um, uh, it's like they, they have to give them a legitimate reason why this is happening, why the shift needs to be done uh, at the same time. Uh, so uh, that's why probably they chose this uh, Mufti to lead their delegation because the Mufti's um, uh, uh, views and um, his decisions are of um, the most respected uh, um, uh, part uh, and they are, they, the Mufti has to be respected in this, uh, in this term, in the terms. And um, the, secondly, that um, uh, the, um, I would like to state that the um, um, Afghan government has released like uh, 5,000, um, more than 5,000 Taliban prisoners, uh, but um, uh, hundreds have gone back to, uh, according to the National Security um, Council, that hundreds have uh, gone back to uh, fighting. Um, and um, uh, this is why um, I think that the Taliban are having a hard time in convincing their foot soldiers to um, uh, keep um, uh, uh, keep keep up to the uh, the the higher level uh, this decision makers and uh, 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 and listen to the um, to the people who are on the negotiation table. Well, thank you. Uh, one more final question, uh, and I think it gets to real to current events in terms of what's going on at this at this moment. As we know, there the the initial talks have been slow. Uh, there's been efforts to try to settle on procedural matters. Uh, we had heard some reportage earlier that there had been an agreement uh, on these on these on these procedural contours of the talks. I think Reuters had a story, but it's since been uh, rejected. I think by the Afghan government and, and perhaps others as well. But um, uh, maybe Ibrahim, if you wanted to, to weigh in very uh, briefly on that, and if, if we probably would have time for one or two other uh, responses, but just to keep it very brief, uh, 60 seconds or so. Oh, you're still muted, uh, Ibrahim. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, so I'll touch on one of the issues that's been holding um, up the talks, which is the Taliban's insistence on Hanafi Fifth. I find that uh, insistence to be quite puzzling. Uh, the procedural talks are supposed to bring in a code of conduct that's supposed to be the point of reference for any disagreements during the talks, uh, but then, then to bring in a point of uh, reference for resolving the point of reference itself uh, seems quite pedantic. Uh, from publicly released statement, it seems that Hanafi Fiqh is supposed to resolve issues of interpretation. Um, there is hardly any, uh, and substantively speaking, there's hardly anything within the books that do pertain to interpretation. Yes, there is the uh, jurisprudential uh, schools, but they usually talk about legal interpretation of uh, religious texts, such as interpreting a verse of the Quran or from the Hadith. Uh, so their application to political documents between warring parties seems to be of limited use. Uh, also, there are minor points within uh, Islamic humanitarian law, for example, uh, conditions for ceasefire, etc. But those are all written in the context of external wars between a Muslim and non-Muslim state. I don't know if uh, it, how much relevant it is to the current situation they're facing. Uh, so why the fuss then? I would say it's more a political move. Uh, the Taliban seem to be uh, saying to the government that you keep mentioning uh, democracy and majority, well, two can play this game. We're going to argue that the majority are Hanafi, so that should be the point of reference uh, for all, any Afghan talks. This assistance could also complicate things when substantial issues are discussed, such as the uh, Taliban might rely on Hanafi texts to argue against issues such as separation of power or rights of citizen. I'll cede the floor back to you. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I mean, if anyone wanted to make a 30, if one more of you wanted to make a 30 second uh, comment, we'd have time for that. But otherwise, we should probably start uh, wrapping up now. Uh, this is, this has been a terrific uh, discussion. We were, you know, we were discussing issues that are very hard um, to address because there are no clear answers on any of this stuff. Uh, so it's sort of, it's, it's difficult, but I feel that I've learned a lot, um, even within that broader context of uncertainty. And that's great credit to, uh, to all of you. We had five panelists who are who know so much about um, the Taliban and who uh, studied very closely 
Um, and uh, I, I really appreciate you all joining us. I thank the audience for tuning in and for posing some excellent questions. Uh, these are issues that are gonna continue to be discussed. The Wilson Center is very focused on um, Afghanistan related matters uh, right now. And in fact, tomorrow um, at 10 a.m. DC time, we'll be having a very interesting discussion on the Afghanistan-Russia relationship, which is very interesting to probe uh, these days. But um, thank you all uh, once again. I um, wish you all well. Please stay safe. Please stay healthy. And I uh, hope to see you here another time soon. So thank you. And uh, we are now adjourned. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Pleasure being with you. Thank you. Thank you all. Really appreciate it. <clears throat>